Atok, and you see his uh, title. So welcome. I'll give you five minutes warning. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, thanks to the organizers. Uh, a very exciting conference. Um, instead of an introduction, I'm going to tell a little story. And the little story is about uh, Starobinsky and Hawking. And the little story played out uh, 20, 20 years ago, and he was following uh, the publication of this paper. So that paper um, involved a long ADS-CFT calculation, one of the first ADS-CFT calculations in cosmology, in which we were trying to calculate the effect um, at strong coupling of um, conformal matter on, on the CMB spectrum uh, in, in Starobinsky's model of inflation. So we concluded this calculation and uh, we sent it off. Then a month later, Starobinsky visits Cambridge and walks into Stephen's office and says, I think the whole thing is just R squared. Why do you do these difficult calculations? And of course, he was right that uh, at the time, if you were interested in observations, R squared was all there was and was all there was needed. And so I gave up on uh, working on these complicated inflationary models for 20 years. But now we have all times have changed and Starobinsky has changed as you heard this morning. And so it's extremely exciting to look for all sorts of corrections to R squared inflation and uh, check these uh, against observations. So here's minimal Starobinsky as we heard this morning. And um, the philosophy of my talk is, be, is the same as what Alexei was telling us this morning except that I'm gonna add different terms to R squared. I'm going to add um, a particular set of what I would call uh, truly geometric higher derivative terms to the action. And of course you can't just uh, do this without all hell breaking loose. So I'm gonna restrict to uh, a very specific terms, namely those terms that leave the uh, friedman lemaitre equation second order, and that also uh, leave the linearized equations of motion around friedman robertson walker backgrounds second order in time derivatives. And so I'm gonna first explore those extensions of uh, minimal Starobinsky, and you'll see they're, they're, they're extremely interesting uh, and exciting both theoretically and observationally. And then I added a second part to my talk um, after hearing uh, a few of the uh, remarks yesterday by, by, by Roger and, 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 uh, and our chair. Uh, I added a few remarks on the problem of initial conditions for inflation with which I will conclude. Uh, so, okay. There we go. Um, yeah, sorry, yes, okay. So um, there are not many combinations, a higher curvature, a higher derivative combinations of uh, the Riemann and the Ricci tensor that uh, satisfy these two criteria that I set out, that the Friedman equation remains second order and that the equations of motion remain second order in time. Of course, I am setting these out because that constraint provides me with a way to do an actual precise calculation without running into ghosts and new degrees of freedom. The combinations that I will focus on, uh, there's a third order term, which you can see uh, written out there. And there is a fourth order um, term as well. I mean, in fact, there, there are three terms as you can see. Um, only the first one will be relevant for uh, the backgrounds and the second one will come in at the perturbations and the third one will be uh, irrelevant. These theories, by the way, uh, they're not my invention. They're being, uh, they were invented a few years ago by these people, and a long list of authors. Uh, good. 
So this is conceptually the setup. We have minimal Starobinsky R squared inflation. And then we have a whole tower of uh, higher derivative terms added to this. And once again, I emphasize that while we can view the R squared term as a scalar gravitational degree of freedom, we cannot view the higher, ter higher order terms that I'm adding as scalar uh, degrees of freedom. So they will be genuine uh, geometric metric uh, corrections which affect the inflationary dynamics without introducing new degrees of freedom. I will also work in, for now, for part one of my talk, I will work in an EFT spirit, meaning that I will treat these extra terms that I'm adding as uh, perturbations or as genuinely associated with a different scale compared to the alpha coefficient of the R squared term, which, as you know, needs to be uh, a fair, have a fairly dominant effect for uh, R squared inflation to work. So the very first question that you might ask is, wait a minute, if you're adding such terms, are you still uber hoped going to have inflation? Because evidently those terms can become more important uh, the further back in time you go. Um, so here's the beginning of an answer to that first question. You calculate the friedman lemaitre equations and you find so psi is our uh, scalar gravitational degree of freedom coming from the R squared term. H squared is the uh, Hubble uh, rate. And then the function F uh, on the left-hand side here, the function F of H squared that you see is defined below here. And uh, it's just H squared for R squared inflation. But then you have a whole tower of corrections uh, to this coming from these higher order terms. And so I will focus on the first two corrections. And in fact, uh, the, in hindsight, in retrospect, we will see that that is justified in the sense that the corrections become less and less important the higher, uh, the, 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 the larger n is, yeah? so the higher order corrections are less important. Um, Provided, of course, we treat these as perturbative corrections to uh, the R squared model. And so uh, here is the answer to the first question. Uh, can we have slow roll inflation in the presence of those higher derivative uh, corrections? And the answer is for some of these, for a certain subset of uh, parameter values. So they're parameterized by all these lambdas. Eh? at each order, there's a lambda term, a uh, little lambda. Eh? Um, and so here uh, you see, for instance, the uh, number of e-falls versus the rolling of the uh, inflaton, so to speak, eh? so the R squared degree of freedom. And the dotted line here is the minimal R squared model. And then we can, then we clearly see a difference here between uh, two kinds of corrections. There are some corrections that make inflation more difficult. Those guys, the inflaton has to roll much further in order to have sufficient number of evils. And there is another set of corrections that makes inflation uh, easier, so to speak. On the other hand, uh, if you look at the right graph, you clearly see that if you're going to exaggerate, meaning if you're going to increase uh, one of these lambdas or uh, then you risk, uh, you risk uh, getting in trouble. So there are clearly uh, constraints on the parameters. Uh, so now let me discuss those constraints. And I'm going to do this. I'm going to propose a new way to discuss those constraints. And my proposal uh, is, uh, entails the, the, fo the following. I'm going to do a holographic analysis of those higher derivative theories in order to constrain their param the parameters of these higher curvature corrections on theoretical grounds, namely by using properties of the dual field theories. Um, but of course, in order to do so, 
uh, I will have to embed these theories in ADS. I will have to add a cosmological constant, a negative cosmological constant. So I'm taking a detour here in order to um, in order to understand better the theoretical grounding of these higher derivative terms that I'm adding. However, I claim that it's not so much of a, of a detour here for the following reason. If you were to think about, so of course, go, going from inflation to ADS or going from the sitter to ADS may strike you as some sort of wacky uh, continuation. I claim there is a lot of physics uh, and uh, in it, and in fact, that this is going to be uh, a much tighter game than, than, than we understand right now. And the reason I'm claiming this is based on some experience with uh, wave functions of the universe, in which it has become clear in the last 10 years that if you look at saddle points of the Hartle-Hawking wave function in cosmology, that in fact there is a very close connection, I would say even a duality between that saddle point and a Euclidean uh, deformed ADS saddle point. These two saddle points that you see here, I claim, are physically equivalent, even though their quantum regime all the way at the bottom appears strikingly different. On the left, we have a Euclidean deformed sphere, whereas on the right, we have a Euclidean deformed ADS regime. But because the no boundary wave function is defined using complex saddle points, the whole difference between uh, ADS and DS and uh, this signature or the other signature is all mixed up because complex cell points don't have a fixed signature, of course. Um, they're generally extensions of, of the usual geometries we work with. And so um, I claim there is a kind of duality, and I will return to this uh, at the end uh, of my talk, between uh, ADS, Euclidean ADS and the sitter. And so the spirit I'm using here is, um, and so classically this looks like a continuation, right? But I'm, this, the picture that you're looking at here is really a semi-classical quantum picture. Uh, and that's what you need to reveal, to reveal that duality. So that's what I have in mind, a kind of underlying duality between ADS and the sitter. And that's now what I'm going to exploit to answer my question on top here, uh, how these lambdas can be constrained on theoretical grounds. What am I going to do? I'm going to see what happens when I add these lambdas in, this, in the physics of this Euclidean ADS region, which I know how to compare with a dual field theory. And then I'm gonna go back uh, to where I was with, uh, with my inflationary story. And so, um, yeah, I'll say this later, good, yeah. Sorry, this slide is busy, but it, it, it calculates a simple object, which is written on top here. It simply calculates the two-point function of an energy momentum tensor um, and uh, you know that in a dual theory, this is uh, given by essentially the central charge times some standard object here. And that calculation is modified, the effective central charge, so to speak, is modified if we are adding these higher derivative terms, that's the same f, f function here, that's, that's the one that symbolizes these uh, higher derivative terms. But of course, now we come to the constraint. You would want this two-point function to be well behaved. Therefore, you would want uh, the central charge to be positive. Therefore, this combination better remains positive. Now we see it is positive in R squared inflation, but then this thing um, can take either sign and can ruin that positivity. So that is a constraint which we derive in from a Euclidean ADS calculation. Now we're gonna translate this to the sitter. This is what the translation amounts to. You could think classically, you could think of this just as a continuation from ADS to the sitter. 
quantum mechanically, this is nothing else than calculating the wave function, not at the boundary of, not at, not at some finite cut of here at the end of the Euclidean ADS regime, but up here where we have glued an additional complex uh, phase uh, which matches it onto a Laurentian inflating universe. That's what the con so-called continuation amounts to quantum mechanically. So if we do that, we have we arrive at a constraint. And strikingly, in, in the sitter, in, in, in the sitter and therefore in inflation. And strikingly, this is a very physical constraint in the sitter. In fact, we know how to interpret it. It says nothing else than that the effective Newton constant must remain positive. And of course, uh, we would rather uh, want to restrict it to theories where that is the case. And you can do the same exercise. Maybe I should not go into detail here in view of time, but you could do the same exercise for the three-point function. And the three-point function is given by that same central charge, but an additional dimensionless constant which I've called T4 here. As before, on ADS, there is a unitarity constraint on the value of that coefficient. The coefficient can be computed and again translated to the sitter, and we again arrive at some sort of uh, constraint in terms of all our uh, parameters, functions in our inflationary theory. And so the leap I'm taking here is I am taking those constraints on my parameters. Uh, in that inflationary regime, which is quasi the sitter, of course, that I'm interested in. And so to summarize these constraints, uh, I'm giving them here explicitly, so we get some numbers in here, for the case in which I add a cubic correction to our squared inflation, and in the case in which I add a quartic correction to our squared inflation, a particular one given here and given there. And the two-point function uh, gives me this constraint. Lambda 3 is the additional parameter that I'm adding. Alpha is the parameter of the r square term. And the three-point function gives me, as you can see, a much, much, much stronger constraint. There's a 10 to the 4 here. Same for the quartic term. The three-point function constraint gives me a very strong constraint on these lambdas. So keep these holographic constraints in mind. They're coming from a Euclidean ADS calculation and requiring a minimal sensible criteria on my uh, dual, hypothetical dual theory. Uh, we, will, we will meet these constraints again. Okay, so now finally, I am ready within so yeah of course as you as you see so they they restrict they restrict those two parameters to be very small and compared to compared to my main alpha uh, parameter of the r square term driving inflation so i'm really interesting in interested here in perturbative corrections to uh, r squared inflation and so to make a long story short, the, the calculation of the perturbations in these modified R squared models is a real pain. Um, but in Leuven, we have brilliant postdocs and students. And so we get the result. And the result is given here. Uh, the advantage, of course, of these specific higher derivative terms is that I that we did not have to deal with additional modes or ghosts precisely because the equations remain second order. And so here we are, uh, the whole package, the uh, scalar tilt, the tensor tilt, the uh, tensor to scalar ratio, these, is, these are the R squared values and these are the corrections. And again, you see, and these uh, typical uh, ratios entering there. Interestingly, and proving my point, I believe, if you look at the consistency relation, then also that relation deviates from the single scalar field uh, relation. And that is, as I was advocating, so these are 
qualitatively different purely geometric terms that we are adding, which are modifying the gravitational dynamics in that early phase of inflation. And so what you're looking at here are genuine uh, corrections to GR. Now, a picture says so much more than uh, these formulas, so let me put it all in a picture. Let me compare these results for the perturbations uh, with the uh, Planck data. And so what we see here uh, is for these two coefficients, lambda 3 and lambda 4, we see the likelihood uh, analysis. And we have that dotted line, which is again my uh, R squared model. And then we have these, um, uh, yeah, so these are the, the one and the two sigma, that, that's the observational input. Those are, those are the, the likelihood contours. And then the green square, that's the cool thing. The green square is really the range um, over which, in this case, the tensor to scalar ratio can vary depending on the value of that cubic term uh, that I'm um, having here. But look at the boundaries of that square. The boundaries of that square are defined by holography. They're defined, they're, they're defined to be the lower and the upper value here, which I derived from these holographic constraints. So strikingly and stunningly, these holographic constraints, and somewhat mysteriously, frankly, uh, coincide nicely with the uh, observational bounds. Not only for L3, lambda 3, but same story for lambda 4. I don't really know what this means, but it's a lot of fun. Um, and so we can, uh, furthermore, of course, we can hope that uh, this is not insignificant, especially when it comes to, when it comes to the tilt, right? This is not insignificant. Uh, it is not uh, excluded that the next generation of experiments really differentiates between these different variations of our square equation, which, uh, of course, um, is an extremely interesting development. Good. Okay. So this concludes part one. How much? How much time do I have, Robert? Eight minutes, I think. Right. That's right. Good. Okay. So now I'm going to return. Uh, of course, I've swept a lot under the carpet, right? As you all know, after the whole conference by now, you know, we've. Um, but there is one piece uh, that I would like to return to. So. Um, the, 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 the big question in, 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 in all this debate is what justifies this kind of analysis in which you add higher derivative terms, even if you're choosing them so carefully as I've done. No uh, second order Friedman equations, uh, no ghosts, uh, holographic constraints. I mean, I've done an effort here to really constrain those theories. But still, you might say, uh, look at that theory away from inflation in inhomogeneous situations and you're still gonna have the whole zoo of problems. So the underlying question really is what justify this kind of analysis. My claim is that this question cannot be answered without uh, also asking how inflation began. Now I have already given an indication of how I think about it because these pictures that you're looking at are uh, amount to a particular model for how inflation began. After all, we are not just looking at inflation here. We are looking at a particular theory of initial conditions, which gives rise to that expanding inflationary trajectory. And so while I have used previously in part one, this sort of underlying quantum construction to constrain two point functions and three point functions, in fact, the quantum construction does a lot more. It also adds a little bit of physics beyond EFT when it comes to the inflationary background itself. That's what's really happening here. That's, that this, 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 this quantum bit is seriously beyond EFT. Why? Because it prescribes um, 
what kind of uh, how, how how a classical a classical evolving background comes come, comes into existence and that background furthermore comes with fluctuations in their ground state because all the fluctuations have to vanish here at the south pole of that of that euclidean instant point um, and that is relevant in the broader discussion for instance the, the discussion which we were having yesterday uh, about yeah uh, the penrose was going on about uh, that inflation doesn't solve anything um well i quite agree that it doesn't solve everything but inflation must be completed really um in order to really address the problem that penrose is interested in namely this entropy problem of course inflation may be unlikely according to some entropic classical phase space argument but notice that this little piece that i'm adding on top of eft changes completely this discussion because now the question becomes what kind of expanding universes are probable or not not on entropic grounds but within this specific quantum state that the no boundary proposal uh, specifies or defines and that completely changes the discussion because you it turns it so it so happens that you really can't create all that many universes if you insist on the no boundary proposal the only universes with a significant probability in this state are those which in fact emerge through uh, an inflationary phase with their fluctuations in the ground state so um, that I think is an important uh, additional piece of information here. Of course, it doesn't solve all problems. Um, the real question I think we're interested in, and the one I felt Starobinsky was not quite addressing this morning, um, and which is relevant for observations is, is this one. And so there is a certain analogy, which Alexei elaborated on a little bit, that the whole business of inflation and fluctuations is very similar to black hole radiation and particles and, uh, and so forth, except for the information loss problem. Well, I disagree with this. There is an information loss problem in cosmology and it's the one you're looking at. The question we're interested in, in my opinion, we are down at the bottom now, and we want to figure out where we roll down from. And unless you have a measure on different inflationary backgrounds, you're not going to answer the question. So the measure problem of inflation, but, the me the, but if you roll down from the left or you roll down from the right, you're going to find a different spectrum of fluctuations. So you have an observationally distinct prediction. So without solving this problem, we really are limiting our ability to use cosmological theory to make predictions that we can falsify our observations. So I claim we do have a genuine measure problem of inflation, an information loss problem, which is relevant for observations. This is, for instance, an observation. Eh? We, we an, an observational probability distribution, which you would hope to calculate from theory. It's a correlation between values of the scalar tilt, the tensor to scalar ratio, and some observational situation. We, we being down here, for instance. So that's, that's the kind of question I think we should uh, aim to answer. And that clearly takes us beyond uh, effective field theory analysis of classical inflation combined with uh, fluctuations. In this case, in this specific theory of initial conditions that I've elaborated on here, the answer goes as follows. The inflating histories rolling down from the left are associated with one type of instanton, whereas the inflating histories rolling down from the right are associated with a second type of instanton. Each instanton comes with a certain action, which has a real and a Lorentzian part. The Lorentzian part describes how the inflating history rolls down. The real part describes the amplitude of that history. A comparison between these two gives you 
um, a relative weighting between these two trajectories. So here are my conclusions. Um, we've explored novel geometric variations of R-squared inflation, in which we found distinct predictions, which are just within reach, I, th I think, of future observations. And we've begin to explore the theoretical grounding of such higher derivative terms, uh, primarily using uh, our holographic link and then constraints from uh, unitarity or no ghost constraints implied by the dual theory. And uh, I have advocated that we really ought to embed those uh, models of inflation in a theory of initial conditions, which by the way includes uh, a kind of observer embedding um, in order to uh, complete uh, that, that picture of inflationary cosmology and put these, uh, we, we gain something. We gain more predictivity than we, than we have with just uh, when we stick to classical inflation. So thank you. Thanks a lot. So I guess there are a couple of questions. Uh, Richard. Uh, thank you. Uh, interesting idea. I'm a little bit um, uh, confused uh, because it, it, it seems to me that uh, the Lovelock theorem tells us that the uh, extra terms that you're adding are, uh, even if they don't uh, have higher derivatives in the perturbative sector, that is in the linearized sector, they will have higher derivatives and they therefore should be suffering from the Ostrogradsky theorem. Um, why do you think that this is not a problem? The reasoning, well, uh, that, that has to do, uh, I believe, with the embedding of the model in a theory of initial conditions. If the no boundary proposal predicts that I am uh, getting into that inflationary phase uh, with everything in the ground state around a fully symmetric background, then I'm guessing. I don't understand that answer. I won't pursue it much longer, but uh, I, I don't understand that answer. The instability problem has to do with what the, uh, the theory is uh, at finite times irrespective of initial conditions, right? Yes, but the instabilities are relevant uh, when the curvature becomes significant, right? So I'm especially interested in whether they can destroy my early universe. Well, I think that they, the Hamiltonian has a linear term. I, I think it's certainly unstable and it, it's going to destroy anything. It depends on how you how you get it going. Well, I'll stop and see the floor to somebody else. So let's move on to Anupam because Anupam had many questions already in the chat. No, oh, I think sorry, uh, one of chat. my questions. Uh, so, Sorry. So nice talk, Thomas. It's very nice, and uh, I I learned something new. So one thing which uh, uh, I think uh, Richard already asked about the instability point that uh, you would expect higher derivatives, and the question is, is this the choice you are making to get rid of the high derivative terms and instability? And if this choice is related to your no boundary proposal, but again, yes. no boundary proposal is the part of assumption. So the question is, is there any justification for the no boundary proposal? Ah, Other than so, observation, maybe there yes, is some better good. justification which one can bring in here. Yeah, so this is a very similar question. Yeah, it's like the question before, right? I, maybe I should clarify this. I view the no boundary proposal, well, uh, as part of the theory. That's my, that, that's my main point. Of course, the theory is an assumption, if you wish. I then have to check whether the theory makes sensible predictions. Eh? Through, for instance, the, observe, the, the CMB and, and blah, blah, blah. But I, I quite agree with you guys that um, even though I can by hand restrict to a perfectly symmetric the sitter background to start off with and all my fluctuations in the ground state, um, of course, the theory in general on, on other backgrounds is going to be is going to be pretty wild. So I cannot really uh, talk meaningfully about this model without also putting getting my theory of initial conditions right. The, 
But I don't understand quantum mechanics guarantees you a spectrum of perturbations that are going to access everything. Yes. So at this point, let's move on to maybe the last question by Alexei. Maybe yeah. just what? OK, uh, thank you, Thomas, for uh, this a very interesting talk. I have, um, I have um, a question regarding your uh, first part. Uh, is it uh, your cubic, um, cubic theory is um, uh, similar to what proposed by Sesterna um, Igrandian Oliver? Um, I should check this. Because when, when my comment, because for this that theory, we found ghosts in this theory, and uh, and this uh, for and um, they indeed, as as you mentioned, as you correctly mentioned, it's it's it has a tensor part, and so the one has to look. Um, the, to, it, it's 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 a paper by um, Petrotonio de de Fe i Trichy uh, Pokelach and myself last year. And indeed, this ghost cannot be, it's not easily found using perturbation theory because it appears effectively, I think, in the, in the fourth order of perturbation theory. So we actually found it uh, that looking by exact solution, exact solutions in the Bianchivan model. So my uh, uh, look at our paper, so once more my statement in this in this cubic cubic uh, gravity, which looks very good in the isotropic cases, it, actually it has an isotropic ghost. Yes, sure, but that I would claim goes beyond the strict EFT uh, regime in which I was using the theory. No, well, I would say it's a ghost. It's a ghost in a given in a given classical modified gravity. Okay, so let's uh, keep this discussion for the main discussion period and let's move on to the second talk by uh, Gianluca Calcani.